Welcome to this week's online service for the congregations and friends of the churches of the Upper Tay Valley and Tenandry. Today we're inside Kenmore Church. After battling with dry rot and wet rot and various other structural problems for the last three or four years, replacing timber and plaster and so on, we've now reached the exciting stage when the painters are in and they're covering up the cracks and patches with fresh coats of paint, transforming the interior from gloom to brightness. And just in time, because next month we have two weddings planned for in here. Weddings are joyous celebrations of new beginnings. They involve putting a line under the past, but also stepping into an unknown future with hope and expectation. And that's maybe a parable for our times. This is Pentecost Sunday, when we celebrate and think about the significance of what happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, when the Holy Spirit burst into the world in a new and dramatic way, and the church stepped into an unknown future with hope and expectation. Our first hymn is a hymn of praise to the Trinity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in a super recording from St. Macher's Cathedral in Old Aberdeen. Glory be to God the Father. Let us pray. Lord God, we, your people, bring you our worship. We praise you, the one true holy God, who made all things, who made human beings in order to share your love. We thank you for your revelation of yourself to the men and women we read about in the Old Testament. We praise you for showing us the perfect human life in Jesus. We thank you that you make yourself available to us now through your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, on this day we thank you for the gift of your Spirit as we remember the events of that first Pentecost. We celebrate the transformation that took place, the confirmation of your promise that you would not leave your followers as orphans, unaided in a dangerous world. Instead, through your Spirit, you remained with them at all times. 
We thank you and praise you that the promise was not only for them, but for all people in all times, and that we today can claim that promise. Forgive us our many failures and failings, for the temptations to which we have given way, for the sin we have allowed to contaminate our souls. As we humbly confess, we can hear you, our Father God, say to us, Your sins are gone. I have cast them as far as the east is from the west, and I shall remember them no more. Lord God, be with us now as we reflect on what your promise means to us and the Church. May our worship be acceptable to you, O Lord. We ask you to hear our prayers as we join our thoughts in the Spirit from our separate homes. Amen. I'm now up on top of the tower with a fantastic view across the hotel and the village behind me. And then out in front of me there is the loch with showers working their way down it. Wonderful views. The church I was brought up in was one of the big churches in the centre of Aberdeen. And it was built in the 19th century as a free church sometime after the disruption. And it had one of the tallest steeples in Union Street. I don't know if there had been some sort of competition but there can be no doubt that the grandness of the building and the height of the steeple were intended as a statement that the breakaway free church had come of age and could at least match the established church in the scale of its ambition. As a child, I must have asked what steeples were for. And I don't know precisely what answer I was given, but I got the idea that steeples pointed to God. And from that, I worked out that the prayers said by the people in the church below must be directed up the steeple in some way. So it followed that the higher the steeple, the more effective the prayers would be. And the ones in our church must have been a lot more effective than those of some of the churches around us with their puny steeples or towers. All complete nonsense, of course, but the idea of being able to reach God through our own efforts is as old as humankind. Early in Genesis, we hear a story of a failed attempt to build a way to God. The Tower of Babel Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastwards, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If, as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there... The Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The tower described here was most likely a ziggurat, which was a Babylonian style of tower. It was a kind of stepped thing, square, and each step built smaller on the one underneath, a bit like a wedding cake. At the top level, there was a shrine where the gods could dwell. The irony of the story here is that the tower was actually so puny that God had to go down to see it. These people wished to reach God and establish their own godlike status. Instead, God came to them and punished their pride. They wished to make a name for themselves. Instead, in the following chapters, we find that God made a name for his humble chosen servant, Abraham. There's a three-way play on words going on here. 
the intended gate of God, Babili, in the Babylonian language, became Balal, which is confusion in Hebrew. And the story occurs in the land of Shinar, which is the area of Mesopotamia, modern Babylon, where modern Iraq, where Babylon was built. And from Genesis right through to Revelation, the name of Babylon is used to signify the pride of humankind in our achievements and our power, achieved through aggression, oppression, and injustice. The coming of the Holy Spirit that we're told about in Acts chapter 2 has often been presented as a reversal of the story of the Tower of Babel. It isn't really that. It's more an indication that the problems caused by diversity of language and culture can be overcome through unity in the Spirit. And like the story of Babel, it shows that we don't reach God with our towers and our steeples, but that God reaches to us. The Holy Spirit, who is with God at creation and inspires individuals at certain times throughout the Old Testament, is now suddenly available to all people at all times. A new beginning indeed. Ros Grant reads to us from the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly there was a noise from the sky which sounded like a strong wind blowing and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, religious men who had come from every country in the world. When they heard this noise, a large crowd gathered. They were all excited because each one of them heard the believers speaking in his own language. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, These people who are talking like this are Galileans. How is it then that all of us hear them speaking in our own native languages? Then Peter stood up with the other eleven apostles and in a loud voice began to speak to the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, listen to me and let me tell you what this means. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Instead, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. This is what I will do in the last days, God says. I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will proclaim my message. Your young men will see visions and your old men will have dreams. Yes, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will proclaim my message. I will perform miracles in the sky above and wonders on the earth below. There will be blood, fire and thick smoke. The sun will be darkened and the moon will turn red as blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And then whoever calls out to the Lord for help will be saved. It's a wonderful scene. Those dark days that had led up to Easter, they have been followed by a kind of restrained excitement when spending time with the risen Lord Jesus, mainly behind closed doors. And then there came this time of quiet prayer and waiting after Jesus' ascension. But those days came to a dramatic end as the secret church burst out onto the streets for all to see and to hear. The gospel is proclaimed to an astonished crowd. Those rough Galileans with their strange northern accents, are speaking out the message in all languages and the dialects represented in the city, full as it was with pilgrims come up for the festival of weeks. Who were these people? What were they talking about? 
And then Peter takes the stand and he preaches the first Christian sermon. People respond immediately and the tiny church starts to grow exponentially. It was clearly a decisive moment. Jesus had told the disciples to expect it and he explained to them what it would all be about. He said that it would be to their benefit, their advantage, that he was physically going away because they would then have the Holy Spirit with them at all times. It was a before and after moment. Just like the cross and the resurrection and the ascension had been events after which nothing could or would be the same as before. What I'd like to do today is explore a little of the before and after of Pentecost. Because when we think about it, we might have some rather tough questions about it. For the disciples, what could they do that they hadn't been able to do before? They'd gone on missionary journeys before. They'd preached the good news of the coming kingdom of God. They'd even performed signs and wonders. So what was new for them? The main difference was not in kind, because they did the same things, but a difference in timing and quantity. They'd completed their apprenticeship, during which they'd learned hands-on, with Jesus there to instruct and correct. Now they were qualified to go into the world themselves, but not on their own. The Spirit of the Father and of Jesus would go with them. The Spirit would remind them of what they had been taught. The Spirit would help them to apply that learning to new circumstances that they would meet along the way. And the Spirit would transform them from the inside, so that they would increasingly show in their lives the qualities and the attributes seen in Jesus. The Spirit would help them to resist temptation and keep them from sinning. All this, and a lot more. It was both the power of the Spirit in their words and deeds, and the example of their character that so impressed people and drew more and more into the circle of believers. When we read the book of Acts and we see what those first Christians did, we can't help but compare them with the church of today. And we ask, if the Spirit brings unity between believers, why is the church divided? If the Spirit helps us to interpret the Scriptures, why do our theologies disagree? If the Spirit guides us, why is our decision-making sometimes so fraught with conflict? If the Spirit energises, why, at least in the West, does so much of the Church appear moribund? The answer cannot be that the Spirit has been withdrawn or is no longer so strong. We only have to look at what is happening in some other parts of the world to see that. Peter, in that sermon, said, The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away. That promise stands. If the problem is not with the Spirit, then it must be us. Maybe over the centuries, as the Church became more established, more integrated into society and politics, it didn't feel the need to rely on the Spirit so much. The Church became confident in itself and in its, in its ability to determine its own course. If this is so, it should not be surprising that in the past century there's been an increasing interest in the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, as the Church in the West has come under increased scrutiny and challenge. We are nothing like as self-confident as our Victorian ancestors who put up these huge churches with their tall steeples. Our pride and our self-reliance have taken a knock. That has forced the church to look again at the New Testament church and ask, what did they have which we have lost? Much of the discussion about the Holy Spirit over the last hundred years or so has focused on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the manifestations of the Spirit in individual lives. And that's been controversial. But these are not the main thing. The signs and wonders are only ever to underline the message, to prove the power behind the words, and to give the people of the church the abilities 
to build up the church in unity. One of the things the Spirit gives to every believer is the fruit of the Spirit. How often we've been told that it isn't fruits, but fruit. Gifts are given differently to different people, so that collectively as the church we have all the necessary skills and abilities. But the fruit is for all of us. We should all exhibit the fruit in our lives, not selectively, but all in equal measure. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is one on the list which I feel in some ways is an odd one out. It's the last one, self-control. Whereas the other eight are all qualities which should be exhibited in our lives and should be seen by other people, they should be obvious. How do we know if someone is exercising self-control? Ideally, we shouldn't be aware of it at all. Of course, if we know someone really well, it may be obvious to us, but maybe not to others who know you less well. Because self-control has to be exercised internally and basically stops us from behaving badly. It is this one which I think is so crucial to how we respond to the Holy Spirit. The human problem is that we want to be godlike, as the people of Babel did. We want to be in control. We decide we can be self-sufficient and we don't need God. Allowing the Holy Spirit into our lives means we have to back off. We have to exercise self-control over our own arguments and assumptions and prejudices and so on. We have to give the Spirit room to work. And that is not easy. To illustrate one way in which this works, I want to look briefly at two examples of decision-making in the Book of Acts one before and one after Pentecost. During the period between Ascension and Pentecost, the followers of Jesus stayed in Jerusalem and spent most of their time in prayer. Jesus had told them to wait. But Peter decided that they, that they would be better prepared for whatever was going to happen if the disciples were back up to strength. So he instituted a vote to decide who should replace Judas as the twelfth man. He referred to scripture to justify what he was proposing and he set out the selection criteria. It had to be someone who had been a follower from the early days, like them. They drew up a short list of two and then asked God to show them which one to appoint and they cast lots. And that led, of course, to a New Testament industrial accident when the lot fell on Matthias. I apologise unreservedly for that old joke. As with many incidents in the Bible, the writer doesn't express any view about whether this was good or bad. We are left to think about it for ourselves. The traditional interpretation assumes that it would have been a good thing, that here was Peter taking charge, as he'd been told to do, and getting on with organising the church. It is always pointed out that the drawing of lots to make an important decision was not repeated, so this does not in itself give us a model to follow. But other than that, it was assumed to be good. But I'm persuaded by other commentators who say that this was actually a mistake. They argue it came from Peter's impatience, his assumption about what was important. He was right in recognising the significance of the number 12, but not in his assessment of the potential candidates. And I think there is something rather comical in the way they went about it. Narrowing it down to a choice of two was almost like saying to God, look, we've made it easy for you. It just has to be one or the other of these. There appear to be no serious consequences from this, though. But nothing more is said about Matthias in Acts. But God had in mind to appoint someone else entirely as an apostle. Just about the least likely person imaginable. Someone who didn't qualify under Peter's criteria. Who had even taken it upon himself to crush the church of Jesus. Paul 
never applied for the vacancy. He was headhunted by Jesus himself. Whichever view you take of this episode, it was a before Pentecost decision. Later, as we read on in Acts, we find another decision-making process. In the early years of the church, most of the believers were Jews, so they shared the same cultural assumptions. Later, as more and more Gentiles, the non-Jews, were converted, a crisis arose around how far those Gentile believers should become Jews before they became Christians. This led to a conference in Jerusalem. We read of how the leaders of the church listened carefully to Paul and Barnabas as they described the evidence of what the Holy Spirit was doing amongst the Gentiles. They studied the scripture for relevant guidance and then they took a wise decision. So wise that when they wrote to the church in Antioch, the letter they they sent was received with great rejoicing. And in their letter there's a phrase which fascinates me. They wrote, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Here were people that were so in tune with the Spirit that they could claim such a thing. I've been in so many church meetings, and I must admit I've chaired quite a few myself, where at the beginning we pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And then, having got that out of the way, we carry on as though it's all up to us. What we need are meetings where we can confidently say of our decisions, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Now, I've been in a growing church where people certainly worked hard, but the Holy Spirit was welcomed and given room to work. And life was full of surprises. The most unlikely people came to faith. Amazing things happened. And all you could do is to look and say humbly, this was not our doing. The Holy Spirit is at work amongst us. For this to happen, we have to exercise self-control over our own views and over our biases and assumptions and our pride and give room for the Holy Spirit to work. If that seems hard, we should remember that self-control is itself part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's a virtuous circle. Being open to God's Spirit will actually help us to be more open to the Spirit. Such is the grace of God, who gives us the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus Christ, and through us to grow his kingdom on earth. And we can be optimistic for the future of the church. As we back off and the Holy Spirit moves in, so the church will thrive again. Your purity.
In our prayers this morning, I'm thinking particularly of two things. The meeting of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland this week and the troubles in Israel-Palestine. Let us pray. Father God, we bring to you our concerns for the world and its people. We are distressed as we see the terrible events in Israel-Palestine. In the psalm, we are told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and so we do. We pray that all sides in the present conflict will stop their violence. But how can there be real and lasting peace without justice? And we are not sure what justice looks like where there is so much history of conflict, so much complication, so much bitterness, so much distrust. We can offer no solution. But Lord God, we plead for your mercy upon these people. We ask for your spirit to bring about reconciliation and peace that no human can achieve. We turn our thoughts towards the General Assembly meeting this week. We pray for all the office bearers and commissioners as they meet online. May they know and enjoy as much as is possible in these circumstances the togetherness and fellowship of the gathering. We pray that your Holy Spirit will rest on them. We pray that they will give space to your Spirit to guide their thoughts, to inspire their plans, to bring wisdom to their decisions. May all they do be for the advancement of your kingdom in this nation. For ourselves, we pray for more of your Spirit, so that our character, our words and our actions will express the fruit of the Spirit, changing us into the likeness of Jesus. We pray for more of the gifts of the Spirit to be shared amongst us, so that your Church is built up in numbers and in unity, all for your glory. May your Kingdom come. May your will be done here on earth as it is with you in heaven. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Now head back into the world with the power of the Holy Spirit to guide you and inspire you and to keep you safe. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, rest upon and remain with each one of you and those whom you love and those whom you pray for this day and forever. Amen.